Okay, we're mostly thinking about the Genesis passage this morning. Uh, it was fitting, coincidentally, that we had the shepherd and the flock, and there's lots to be said there. Um, Jesus is the good shepherd. Of course, Sandra also is a pretty good shepherd, and Shirley helps out, and there's a goodly number of people. We have shepherds here, but that's for another sermon, perhaps. I love that Genesis passage. I think it's always worth remembering, of course, that it isn't a science text. It wasn't here to tell us about the order in which things were put together. None of the early church fathers ever thought that that's what it was here to do. But it is here to tell us timeless truths about God and humanity and creation and how we relate to each other. It's fundamental to our view of the earth and how we should treat it. Does it make you wonder? What does it make you wonder, I wonder? What questions does it bring to mind? You hear that thing, that very, very old chunk of scripture. I wonder what you're thinking. My first one is, is why? Why does God give us all this stuff to do, having dominion and looking after all these creatures and the planet? God is all-powerful. That's one of the messages. God has just made, in just six days, why it took him so long, I know not, but he has just thrown together an entire cosmos in six days. It's pretty impressive. And then he says, can you all look after this for me, please? And he goes off for a day of rest, as if it's like to put his feet up. Oh, I'm quite tired, thank you very much. Could you all take care of this? That's, well, that's not the case. That isn't the story of rest and Sabbath, is it? And God hasn't gone anywhere. God could very easily, God could run this place a lot better than us. Let's be clear about that. I think that's evident looking at the way all sorts of things go on. And yet, he says to humanity, having made all these things that are good, he says to humanity, you do this. And it seems to me that having dominion over creation is an image-bearing thing. It's the bit that sets us apart. He made us in his image. The creation of everything else thus far had been good, And then after he's made humanity in his image and given us dominion, he says, this now is very good. There's something extra special about the creation of humanity and that dominion. We're created in the image of God, blessed and then told to be fruitful and subdue the earth. Being the image of God is um, a peculiar thing. Ancient rulers and emperors would often get an image of themselves and set it in towns and places in the ancient world, like, this is mine It's like a stamp of authority. This person, the person who has this image is in charge. This will be the local ambassador. This is the person who can tell you what to do. Bearing the image of God is like being God's ambassador into the world is one of the things that means. We walk around as sort of chunks of God with God's authority to do God's work, which is peculiar. This business with the animals of us being in charge of them is a part of us being created a bit like God, of doing God's work in God's way on God's behalf that we're invited into unnecessarily. And somehow this is good for us. It's clearly, it's not good for God. He doesn't need a break. I'm not sure it's necessarily good for the animals. It's not as good as if God did it. He could do it without us. And yet it is somehow good for us to be involved in doing God's work in God's way on God's behalf. Looking after animals is in some way a blessing. So this day of our pet service, we're going to be thinking, and we could talk about creation and climate change and things like that, but we're going to zero in on how we relate to animals and domestic animals. What good comes of that? If we had no Bible, if we had no scripture, no tradition, What could we learn of God and life and faith from looking at how we relate to our pets? If they are a blessing, something good must be growing in us from that. Does that make sense? So that's kind of our text today will be our many, many pets. And uh, I make no apologies. When someone says pets, I think dogs. That's my flavour of having pets. But I hope to include those of you who prefer cats or horses, or sheep, or rabbits, or guinea pigs, or hamsters, or gerbils, or fish, or whatsoever it is. I think our variety in choosing pets is part of what makes us the joyful kaleidoscope of ways in which we bear that image of God. So, did have a think for a moment, genuinely. What is it that our pets teach us about life and faith and God? Right. We are then here on earth to look after those animals 
Right. But this predator situation transfers right to life. Okay, so we learned something about predators and, and prey, about, about maybe about bullies, about keeping people safe, about natural order. Okay. I don't think that occurred to me. Okay. What else might we learn about pets? I'll only ask you one or two. I've got a few answers, don't worry. I am, I am prepped. I'm not, it's not over to you. Any other thoughts that we might learn about God, life, and faith from our pets? Brenda? We learn, yes, we learn about safety and protection and looking after the least. Yes, we'll cover that. Good, I've got that one. Yes, Shirley. I learned that you always look after your pets first before anything else. Okay. And gradually that teaches you people to look after your children first. Okay, so it teaches you about, about service, about the order of things. A lack of selfishness, like because they can't do it, we have to look after them. I don't know if I've got that. That's good though. Yeah. Okay. Lizzie. I think you learn about how they love you without any words or any expression. Yeah. And that they will love you and they will just come and look to you. How they just love you and without words. Those are two good points. Yes, we're going to look at that. I think that's true. I think first and foremost, what we learn. Um, from our pets. It's all about love, isn't it? Um, The love we have with our pets, I think the first point to make is just good. It isn't necessarily there to teach us something. It isn't a means to an end, although it does teach us things. It is just good to be loved by our pets. Whether you're a dog person or a cat person or a horse, rabbit, snake, or stick insect person. I don't know if snakes wag their tails when you come into the room, or your stick insects show their joy. But many of our animals, you know, like, and if a cat shows any affection for you when you walk into the house, you have one for the week, right? That's, that's a big deal. But that unearned affection, the joy in holding or stroking or being sat on or warmed by, is just good for us, isn't it? The part of what we get from our pets is that love is good. Um, and therapeutics, why we have Fudge and Poppy as therapy dogs here at church, and other animals can be trained as therapy animals, have a word with us. But there's more. Do you know that phrase, um, no one loves you as much as your dog? You heard that? It's printed on mugs and T-shirts and tea towels and other things by dog people. You heard that phrase. No one loves you as much as your dog. Well, God does. I think that's the first thing, and it'll be the last thing you hear. God is love, and loves you vastly more, even than those glimpses we get of love from our pets. What can we learn about God, who is love, in how we love our pets and how they love us? Love means service. It means looking after things. Our pets teach us that. It's not just a feeling. It's all well and good to say, I love my pets, but you have to do something about it. Uh, You'd be aware who is Fudge's favourite in our house. Who who is Fudge's favourite in our house? It's Victoria, right? And why is that? I don't think it's just that Fudge has remarkable taste. It's that Victoria is the one who, by and large, gets up in the morning and lets her out for going to the toilet and takes her for a walk and feeds her and plays with her and grooms her. Victoria puts the effort in. Those people who, who do that, that sense of responsibility and service, we, you get a bond in it. That loving service is important. It's love is actions, is doing stuff for people, and it teaches us that. We learn a lot of other things, though. Uh, What else do we learn? We learn that there are limitations in having pets. Have you seen these signs? Some plane, you're out for a walk, and let's, uh, we'll go in, oh, we won't go in there. I I couldn't find a similar no bunny rabbits sign. But if you've got pets, they are a pain in the backside sometimes. You are not always allowed in restaurants or shops. You can't take your horse in Marks and Spencers. I have not tried. I wonder if you could get like a therapy horse and get the thing on it. Maybe you could. Probably. There are, there are, so there are therapy horses. Can you take it in Marks and Spencers? I don't know. I want to find out. But they're a pain in the back. So have you ever tried to book boarding for your rabbits? Rabbits are hard to get boarders for. Or sitters for a snake. Not everybody wants to come round and feed your snake. Your pets, if you choose to have a pet, it is going to cramp your style. Is that true? And it's true. 
But limits are good. Rules are good. That's why sports and games have rules in them. Limits actually somehow add to the richness of life. Being forced to colour within the lines makes for better pictures. You might get fewer activities available to you if you choose a life with pets. But I think your life is not smaller. It is richer and deeper and wider, even though that is limited. It's a good reminder that limits are good for us. We get that from our pets. Another upside from a downside um, is, I think, forgiveness and patience. Anyone ever had their slippers pooped in, chewed, bunnies eating dining room chairs? Have you seen these memes on the internet? These pictures come up, people shaming their, their pets. I like, you can even get sh hedgehog shaming pictures. I crawl into empty slippers and take a poop so that whoever puts it on gets poop on their toes. I ate glittery Christmas ornaments and now I have fabulous disco poo. Brilliant, naughty dog. There's a, what's the next one? Was there a naughty cat on this one? Yes. I looked my mum in the eye while I peed on her hoodie. Um, and a naughty toucan. And toucans are smart birds. We make our pets behave in a human world. We make them fit in with us. We have expectations. And you can do a bit of training. I mean, on some things. I don't know how well you can train a toucan. But squishing them into our world inevitably means bearing with them when they get stuff wrong. They teach us so much about relationships. Dominion doesn't mean being the boss of these things. It's not ownership and mastery. We are called to cherish our pets as much as we are each other. And that is going to mean bearing with them and forgiving them and being nice to them and working out that if they've got something wrong, probably it's our fault for putting them in a situation they weren't fit for. I think you can form quite a reasonable judgment of a society or a person by, by how they treat the least, by how they treat their pets or their prisoners or their children. It's interesting. Um, do you know that the RSPCA, Royal Society for the Protection of Child Cruelty to Animals, gets three times as much every year in donations as the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children? I wonder what that tells us in this society? Are we actually valuing our cats and dogs as much as we are prepared to forgive them their naughtiness, as much as we are people? Are the people we sometimes blame for their circumstances really any less worthy than these naughty cats and dogs and toucans? If we look at ourselves perhaps as a bit like our pets, they remind us of how God loves us. Psychologists have this term, unconditional positive regard. It's what you need from your therapist. You need to know you're in a safe space, that they are going to think positively of you. Uh, it's what you get from your dog. It is not what you get from your cat. Sorry. Um, but it is what you get from God. However naughty we are, God is not hanging these shameful notes around our necks, putting us up in public going, I forgot to light the Easter candle, I am a bad vicar. There is this unconditional positive regard. It doesn't mean that God doesn't care when we get stuff wrong, but it doesn't stop him loving us. And we often have this unconditional positive regard for our pets. It's a wonderful way for us to then learn how to be gracious to other people. We look at our pets with love. We forgive them when they get all this stuff wrong. How well do we transfer that grace to the people in our lives? Our pets are a lesson in forgiveness and in grace, what we receive and what we should be paying forwards. Um, we learn about grief from our pets. I was once at a wedding and at some very posh country house, and there was a pet tortoise there that had previously been, I am assured, Clive of India's pet tortoise. This tortoise was 150 years old. Most of our pets do not live that long. I think it's tricky, isn't it? Pets don't. We love our pets as much as we can, but they love us for the whole of their lives. And the cost of that love is grief. It is a terrible gift, but I think a necessary one. Perhaps it's one of the other reasons we get them for our kids. It's kind of a smaller, I don't mean smaller. It's a, maybe a safer way for, for us to learn about grief um, at, a, at an earlier age having pets. It's a brutal lesson, but would our lives be better without grief? I think not, because it is the price of love, and those are peculiar lessons that it does us well to learn how to do alongside each other. Our pets, somebody talked about, Lizzie talked about uh, it being good to, to learn about 
being, about loving our pets without words. Cats like to be with us. I mentioned that sometimes, perhaps not as often, in the most peculiar and not always comfortable ways. I'm not, I like cats. The claws give me paws, but uh, I'd be worried if that was happening. But, you know, if the cat chooses you, you are winning, like I said. But they don't talk to us. We can talk to them, and it's lovely, but there is such a joy in being present with your animals. It is so deeply satisfying. I love the companionable quiet that comes when there isn't an expectation, of, I say not of talk, but not of a response. My dog thinks I am the best conversationalist going, which is nice. There is a deep joy, I think, that we can also learn to be in the company of others, and in the company of God without necessarily expectations of it being about what we say and what we hear, just being with. Our relationships with our pets, at, the, at their best, go beyond what you might call the transactional. That makes sense? They're ends in themselves. They're not about what we get from them as much as we do get all these things. Many of them started as practical things. Of course, we used to get dogs to help us with hunting. We might have got cats to help keep the mice away. Uh, we get horses to pull us around. I don't know why we had stick insects and, and such. But you know, we got them practically, but we keep them for their presence. Is there something we can learn about being willing to be with each other and with God without words, without an end? I think so. Um, our pets give us a space to let our emotions out in a safe way, especially in this country. We're not very good. There's a picture of a grumpy old man feeling a bit less grumpy with his parrot. On this note, please don't get a parrot. I've heard horrors. Parrots live a very long time, and they're best off flying around in jungles. Please don't get a parrot. But it is nice that this guy's found one, and it's putting a smile on his face. We can be a bit of a miserable bunch, the English. We are, you know, we talk about the weather and the tulips and all of that, but not necessarily our feelings. Our pets give us this safe space to let things out and be real with each other. Perhaps if we can remember to, to let the walls down a little bit like we do with our pets, if we can do that alongside other people and with God, we'll be well served. I like horses. Horses are great. I'd like a therapy horse. I think they're very therapeutic. And we used to ride horses for transport. The, we used to think horses were, you know, that's how we got around. It's how we powered the Industrial Revolution, all of those things. No one in this country needs a horse anymore. There's a tiny number still working, but mostly, you know, it's an optional thing. And the rest of them are, are just for joy, for leisure, for delight. It's surprising that we've kept hold of them, but perhaps it's not. Maybe it speaks to the love and connection that we're designed to have with them. There is such a wonderful, calming presence about a big animal, isn't there? A bit frightening, but when you get over that, I do love being with a horse. Uh, if you need to be with a horse, there are people we know who can help you out with that. Quite a funny thing about horses. Yes, sir. Um, we get horses regularly coming up to Foxhall. Yes. Uh, and Lord's quite pleased because... Yes, you do. Uh, yeah, horses are not a transactional pet, but they do give us something very good for the roses. Carvely and Bloom is grateful for them all the time. Um, I like. Have you, who's ridden a horse? Who am I talking to? Who's ridden a horse ever? Some of us ride them quite often. I love horse riding. I think what I love about it, it's not like riding a bike. You're not in charge of the horse. There's a there's a symbiosis and a rhythm. Uh, it's a bit like prayer, I think, horse riding. You know, you can't tell the horse what to do and how to behave. Certainly there's training, but you have to feel your way and pay attention to the horse. And there's a give and take and a rhythm to be in. And if you ride the same horse again and again, you get used to each other and end up communicating with each other through your knees. It's really odd, but I think that's, that's truly profound that there is some way of communication that we, maybe we don't bother to put into practice with each other and with God, but we have to with pets that is really good for us. There's something about discipleship and growth and prayer. Those unforced rhythms of grace that Jesus talked about, I think look a lot like horse riding. 
Those are my thoughts on what we learn from pets. They are a rich source of blessing to us all. They teach us, as I said, about discipleship. They help us to grow up and learn responsibility. They teach us to be kind and gracious and forgiving and to serve them. They remind us that limits are okay. Then it is good simply to be with each other, to treat people as means and not ends, as ends and not means. Got that the wrong way around. But most of all, most of all, as you know, if you have ever walked into a house and seen a pet look up at you like that, they remind us of how much God loves us. If no one loves you as much as your dog, then no one, really no one, loves you as much as your God. That is certainly true. You are loved. I hope that you go away knowing that, remembering that, and being reminded every time you see yours or someone else's pet. You are deeply loved. Amen.